Good to see you. What a beautiful day. You know, I wouldn't be, we're a little bit down in attendance today compared to what we have been. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you guys, some of our other people in our body of Christ went out their front door this morning and stood in the sunshine and said, I am doing something outside. And so, man, what a beautiful, I went outside and greeted a few of you outside and man, this is just one of those beautiful days. Now, you know, I spent uh, this last week in New York. Did you know that? Some of you knew that I was in New York. And, you know, New York is really not a place for me. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> Amy, some of you are surprised I made it back. Well, the only reason I made it back is because my wife, yeah, she, she was my guide. And so I just went wherever she went. And the bad thing is she gets turned around and you can't ever find the sun in that place. It's just buildings. And so, you know, I, I'd look up, try to figure out where I am. There's no way to know where you are. And so you just have to kind of find your way around. And it was interesting. It's you know, for a Texas boy, it's really kind of an eye-opening experience. There's people everywhere. People ask me, well, how was New York? It was crowded. It was, very, it was very crowded. Now, I did have a good time because I was there with my wife. If it wasn't for her, I would not have gone myself. Now, she wanted to go see, since she was a little child, she wanted to go see Billy Joel in concert. And that was actually his 70th birthday, and he uh, did a concert. And it was really good, and it was at Madison Square Gardens is where we were. And so it was very interesting, lots of very interesting people. Um, yeah. Some of you have been there. You know what I'm talking about. Now, I will tell you something funny that happened. I was, we were riding on a, the tram between airports or bus between airports, and there was a guy, and everybody talks on those little ear things, and nobody makes eye contact. If you make eye contact with somebody, they get uncomfortable. And so I figured that out because I go around, I make eye contact with everybody, you know. Well, anyway, there's this guy talking on his phone with those little ear things, and he kept saying, no, tram. And he'd say, no, 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 stop saying that. It's tram. And then he said, there is no P. You're saying a bad word. <laughs> Stop saying that. So anyway, you know what? It is an incredibly diverse place. And people, I mean, you can walk down one block and you hear five different languages spoken. Um, it's really, it was really something else. Now, I did, I did enjoy Wall Street and seeing some of the things down there. And it, Has anybody been there before to Wall Street? Isn't the street small? It's not what I expected at all. It's very narrow. So anyway, enough about New York. I also want to say to you, happy Mother's Day. That is for, Mother's Day is a celebration for everybody. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure everybody in here has had a mother, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you all have. And so ha happy Mother's Day to all of you. Now, today is not going to be a typical Mother's Day message. Yeah, maybe some of you expected me to go to Proverbs 31 or to preach on Mary, and we're not going to do that. We're going to continue in the book of Revelation today. And so some of you are probably relieved that I'm not going to Proverbs 31. How many of you have heard a Mother's Day message on Proverbs 31 before? Yeah, maybe from me if you've been around here long enough. I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look. But today we're going to continue in the book of Revelation. We're in chapter 11. And I have thoroughly enjoyed the, these next few chapters are really good. And, and they're flashing forward and flashing back, and they're filling in some gaps. And so you kind of have to pay attention to where you are in, in Revelation chapter 11. We'll start off with the first two verses, and then I'll kind of give you some background of what's going on and where we are. It says, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. So this is talking about the temple, and he's given a measuring rod to go measure it. Now remember, we believe that the temple has to be rebuilt. And the reason we believe the temple has to be rebuilt is because of the abomination of desolation. Do you remember that? In Daniel chapter 9, it says that the Antichrist will go into the temple and declare himself to be God in the middle of the week, it says, which is the 70th week. 
Jesus also references this in Matthew chapter 24. Well, for the Antichrist to go into the temple, there has to be a temple. Well, is there a temple now? No, there's not. In fact, the Dome of the Rock sits on the spot where the temple was. That's where the name came from because the rock of the Dome of the Rock is supposedly where Muhammad ascended to heaven, and that rock is what the Ark of the Covenant used to sit on in the Holy of Holies. Remember, there's the common, there's the common place where everybody could go, and then you went into the temple, and remember the, the altar with the four horns where they would burn incense. We, we talked about that. You're not remembering? Okay, good. You are remembering. Good. And then in that place, then there was the veil. That was called the most holy place. Well, then behind the veil that was torn from the top to the bottom when Jesus died on the cross, behind that veil was the Ark of the Covenant, and that was the Holy of Holies. Okay? Now, the temple has not been rebuilt yet. In fact, there's an obstacle in the way. And, you know, Israel would love to rebuild the temple. They want to rebuild the temple. And I've heard, I haven't seen myself, but I've heard that they have the plans, they have all the materials ready and lined up, and they want to rebuild the temple to this day. They're waiting for an opportunity. Now, how do they get that opportunity? You know, what would happen if they went and destroyed the Dome of the Rock? Would they even have a chance to rebuild the temple? No, the international community wouldn't stand for it. You know, that is, outside of Mecca, I think that is the, it's either the second or the third most holy, I think it's the second most holy site in Muslim, in Islam, is the Dome of the Rock. The most holy is Mecca, okay? And so you can't just, they just can't go and destroy it, but something has to happen. And I spoke to you about this a few weeks ago, maybe a few months ago, when we were looking at the sixth seal. Something has to happen. Well, in the sixth seal, we'll go to Matthew 24 and look. I'm not going to go back in the book of Revelation. But in Matthew 20, 24, it talks about things that are happening through in the seals. And then in Revelation, when it talks about the sixth seal, it says, every mountain will be moved out of its place and every island. I mean, this is an incredible event that takes place on the earth. And I've expressed to you, I think the rapture of the church happens at the sixth seal. I think it happens right there. There's several signs. There's the blood moon, which is a sign of the rapture of the church, according to Joel. And then there's several things that happen, the wrath of the lamb and just the, tra the trauma of it all. And the nations are basically brought down to their knees and civilization is brought down to their knees. Well, you know what? The Dome of the Rock sits on a mount. Did you know that? I think the Dome of the Rock is destroyed at the sixth seal. And I think that prepares the way for the 70th week for the first three and a half years for the temple to be rebuilt. Now, some of the things I'm telling you are straight from the scripture and some of them I'm filling in gaps with my opinion. And I've been clear to you about that you know, you may have a different opinion, and that's fine. You know, as long as your opinion about Jesus Christ is true. Jesus was God in the flesh, correct? He was the God-man. He died on the cross as the Lamb of God as a sacrifice for our sins. And by his shed blood, we by faith have forgiveness of sins, correct? Amen. Now, what the scriptures say, that, I mean, God could have given us many more details to fill in the gaps, but he's left the gaps to, to study and to try to figure out and put this together. It's like a giant puzzle, isn't it? Yes. All right, you guys, you guys are thinking about the sun and the outdoors too, I can tell. So now turning back to Matthew chapter 24. Matt, the reason I'm doing this is because Revelation chapter 11 basically goes back now. We've been studying the trumpets, and then there's a scene in heaven, and Revelation chapter 11 goes back, I believe, to the beginning of the 70th week, after the sixth seal, and there's some things that happened, and remember I told you that, you know, it is harder than a person might think to find a scripture and talk at the same time. There we go. Now, Matthew chapter 24, I'm going to start down at verse 4. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Well, the culmination of that is the white horse, which is the appearance of the Antichrist, right? That's the, known as the white horse, or of the first horseman of the apocalypse, or the first seal. It's also the first seal. Okay, then 
Verse 6, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not frightened, but those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. Do you remember the second horse, the red horse, wars? It's in order. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's still the, the red horse. Various places there will be famines and earthquakes. That's the black horse, the third seal. Jesus is laying it out in perfect order to interpret the revelation by it. And so the third seal, the black horse, is famines. And then, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. And so these things will continue to build. Now, what's interesting about that is birth pangs, when a person, when a, well, this is Mother's Day, so here's the Mother's Day message, right? It's about birth. (laughs) When you're giving birth, apparently, I've never done it. When you're giving birth, I've heard that I was involved in it, but I was a baby at the time. But, by the way, you know, it was just my birthday. My birthday was May 8th. I was actually, yeah, get this. This is an awe moment. I was born on Mother's Day. See, I told you that's an awe moment. (laughs) Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. (laughs) That was good right there. You can go. (laughs) Not that kind of awe, yeah. Now you've made me lose my train of thought. Have you ever wished that was like one of those, like an interactive preacher on the internet where you could just, like on Pandora, you can give me a thumbs down and I'll move on? Have you ever thought, <laughs> where's the button for this guy? <laughs> Maybe I'd get a thumbs up too, I don't know. Oh yeah, and the fourth horse is death. And if you look in Revelation at the fourth seal, it talks about the fourth seal as being a result of the first three. And so, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs, and birth pangs As you get closer to the birth, they increase in intensity and frequency, correct? So what we would expect is all of these horses to continue to increase until a point in time when basically the culmination of them takes place. And that would be the arrival of the Antichrist as a culmination of all the false Christs building up to that point. Intensity and frequency increasing up to that point. Okay, now verse 9 Do you remember what the fifth seal is before you look? The fifth seal is martyrdom. And guess what verse 9 is? Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold. And that's a sign of the end of the age. Remember in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul said two things have to take place before the rapture of the church. One is the apostasy, the love of many grow cold, right, and people falling away from the faith. Apostasy has to take place. The other thing that has to take place before the appearance of the Antichrist, do you remember? No, the before, uh, yeah, the reason I said that is because I just completely lost myself there. No, before the rapture of the church, two things have to take place. The apostasy and the appearance of the Antichrist, which the appearance of the Antichrist is the first seal. So I believe because of that scripture, the rapture has to be after the first seal. That's why I think it's the sixth seal. So these are the signs of the end of the age, many falling away and false prophets And then in verse 13, I believe Jesus is referencing the rapture. It says, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Saved from what? Anytime you see that word in the New Testament, you have to say saved from what? They're saved from your sins. They're saved from hell. They're saved from circumstances. Saved from all kinds of things. And the word endure there is actually better interpreted remains. Well, it really looks like the rapture if you do that. But the one who remains to the end... He will be saved from what? The 70th week. Now, verse 14 is often applied to the age in which we live. I don't think this is in reference to the age in which we live at all. I think verse 14 is about the first three and a half years, which we're going to be getting to with Revelation chapter 11 also filling in some of the gaps. It says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. I think that's a reference to the 144,000 that preached the first three and a half years. I think that's a reference also to the two prophets that we're going to be looking at who preached the gospel during the first three and a half years. And then verse 15, 
If I'm right, then what would be next? The midpoint of the 70th week. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. We're going to pause there and go back to Revelation chapter 11. I wanted to give you that summary to kind of go back and look at Revelation chapter 11. Now, we've looked at some of the trumpets. There was hail and fire mixed with blood. There was the sea turning to blood. There was the waters being soured, and there was darkness. And some of these things may be the result of nuclear winter and radiation poisoning. It certainly could be. And then there's boils, the, the, the fifth trumpet, where men shall seek death and will not find it, and they'll have this condition for five months. All of these things have taken place, and now we're in Revelation chapter 11, and we're going back and filling in some gaps of some other things that are happening during the same time period. Now, Revelation chapter 11 is primarily about the two witnesses or the two prophets, but there is, in verse 1 and 2, there's this reference to the temple, this measuring rod. But what do you do when you build something? You have to measure. What is it? You measure once and cut twice, something like that? See, that's why I always mess up. (laughs) You know, I'm still to this day, of all the things I've built, I have yet, and I've tried, I have yet to build anything square. I don't know why, I just can't do it. You would think my engineering background, I could build something square, but it is not. Go, Go out there and look at my barn. It stands, it's strong, but it is not square. That's really going to frustrate some some people that come after me if they want to build upon what I've built. Even the porch on the side of my house isn't square. But, hey, it's still standing. Okay, where were we? Oh, yeah, measuring. We measured twice, cut once, and here is an example. I think this is a reference to the rebuilt temple of God. And then leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. And then these two witnesses, if we look at three and four, they're connected somehow to the temple. They're right after it. It says, and I will grant authority... To my two witnesses, they will prophesy for 1,260 days days clothed in sackcloth. 1,260 days is three and a half years or 42 months of 30-day months on the Hebrew calendar. So they're going to prophesy for three and a half years. Now, remember, at the midpoint, according to Daniel, the two prophets die, right? The Antichrist, by the power of Satan, kills them. And so at the midpoint, that's three and a half years. So basically, they preach from the beginning of the 70th week to the midpoint. Do you see that? They have to. They have to, because at the midpoint, the Antichrist kills them by the power of Satan. We'll look at that also. So they preach for three and a half years. You know what's interesting about that is that's about the time of Jesus' ministry also. And here are these two prophets. They're two prophets of old, and God has granted them great authority, and they're his witnesses. Now, what are we now? We are witnesses also, aren't we? You know, another reason I think the church has been raptured out is because here now the 144,000 and the two prophets are the witnesses. In fact, we'll see in a little bit, they're the two lampstands. Well, what does it say in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20? We are the lampstands, but we're no longer. The church is no longer at this point. It's literally like, just what, like what it says, there's 70 weeks decreed for the Jews, okay? And then after the 69th week, Jesus entered triumphantly, and the nation of Israel rejected Jesus. Not all Jews rejected Jesus. And then there's this time period, the church age in between, and the 70th week goes back to being just like it was in the Old Testament. You have prophets. Now, the prophets... And, or it's their responsibility and the ministering of the word, and you have a temple. It's just like in the Old Testament again. The church has been removed, and now we finish the 70th week, which is for the Jews, which is for Israel. Now, one key thing here is I will grant authority to my two witnesses. They will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, which the olive tree is a symbol for Israel. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. So wait a minute. 
We're the lampstand. Remember, I just told you that. But the church has been removed at this point. And so now they are the lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now, what do you put in the lampstand? In the temple, what would you use? You would use oil, correct? And that oil was symbolic of what? The Holy Spirit. Well, that's the church, right? We are the lampstand, and we're fed by the Holy Spirit so that we can be a light in a dark world. But now the church is not there, and so now the two prophets are that. Do you see that? They are the ones that are being fed by the Spirit. They are the ones that are the light to the world now and the 144,000 that go out preaching the gospel. So what is their message going to be? I think it's going to be very similar to our message. I think there's going to be, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the age in which we live. The salvation of Jesus Christ. But also, they're going to preach, they're going to preach a warning message also. They're going to be talking about the trumpet judgments. They're going to be talking about judgments that come. They're going to be telling them, beware, Jesus Christ is coming in judgment. They're going to be preaching Jesus Christ. Now, what about their identity? You know, there's a lot of speculation about their identity. You know, the Bible doesn't say. It doesn't say at all. You know, it wouldn't do a whole lot of good for us to study their identity in great depth because there's no certainty of who they are. Now, I'll give you my opinion if you want it. Okay, we'll skip it. <laughs> do you want it? Okay, most people think, most scholars say, well, it's probably Elijah and Moses. And the reason they say that is because of the plagues that come about and the supernatural ability that they're given is very much like the plagues of Egypt and then also the famines that Elijah brought about, okay? So they think, well, the characteristics fit. I think that's a weak argument. And the reason I think that is because there's a common denominator behind Moses and Elijah, isn't there? Isn't it God doing all of that through them? And so that, I don't think that's a good argument that it's Moses and Elijah. Now here's who I think it is. Just guessing. I think it's Enoch and Elijah. And the reason is because they never died. These two prophets are going to die. Now Enoch walked with God and he was no more, right? He was taken as a symbolic of the rapture of the church also. He was taken and then Elijah was taken away in a chariot of fire, correct? He never experienced death. May not be. It may not be even them at all. It may be somebody else. The Bible doesn't say. If God wanted us to know, he would have told us. Now, I've told you my guess. I think it's Enoch and Elijah. So, yeah, take it, take it, crumple it up, throw it away, store it in your head, whatever you want to do with it. All right, now look at verse 5. If anyone wants to harm them, Fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. Now, that would be a great power to have. Have you ever considered, if you could have a supernatural power, what would it be? That would be a good one. I mean, think of that. You just fire come out of your mouth. Rawr. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that would be awesome. It's probably a good reason God did not give me anything like that. If anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. Now, what's interesting about that to me is why do people want to harm them? You know what? I can go in New York. I saw people like this. They didn't have fire coming out of their mouth, but they were like in sack claws and nobody makes eye contact. They were sitting on a corner, some of them standing up talking, some of them waving their arms. Everybody ignores them. Why are these two prophets the center of attention and people are wanting to destroy them? Well, remember I talked about the Dome of the Rock is being destroyed and the temple is being built. One thing that always used to bug me is why or how could the temple be rebuilt? The surrounding nations had to be in shambles. There's two reasons I think the temple could be rebuilt at this time. Not at this time, but at that time that we're studying. You understand. The first one is the peace treaty of the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 9, it says that the Antichrist is going to sign a peace treaty with Israel. Now, why would he do that? Why does he have any interest in signing a peace treaty with Israel? Well, here, this more speculation. What if during the sixth seal, the armies were already gathering, which remember wars and rumors of wars, the armies are already gathering to destroy Israel, and those armies are decimated by the sixth seal. What if? And then Israel is in a position now to, to go march and gain ground like crazy. 
Well, the Antichrist then, it would be to their advantage to sign a peace treaty to keep Israel from doing that. Look, you rebuild the temple, but you don't take any ground. Well, how would the Muslim nations ever agree to that? Well, what if the Antichrist would go to them and tell them, look, I'm going to sign this peace treaty with them. That will give us time to gather our armies, and this is certain. I will not allow them to make one sacrifice in their new temple. And then, when we get gathered up, we're going to destroy them once and for all. That's the Battle of Armageddon. So why would the Antichrist sign a peace treaty? Well, the nations, I think Israel must have been at some advantage after the sixth seal. And he signed a peace treaty with them to keep them from advancing their territory. And that peace treaty must have allowed for the rebuilding of the temple temporarily behind the scenes. Okay? Now, that's one thing that allows them to. But what about, then the other thing I always thought about, what about all the, the zealots? that would strap a bomb to themselves and walk to the construction site and just destroy it on an instant. You know they would. You know they'd want to. How would they ever get the thing built? This is, again, my opinion. What if the two prophets are standing at the construction site on the mount, and anybody that comes up to them to oppose them, they destroy them with fire? May not be that way. But remember also the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist goes up and kills the two prophets and then enters the temple. So it does seem like they're kind of linked, doesn't it, to the temple construction and to the finished temple. These two witnesses seems to fit. I'll be witnessing these things from heaven. I hope you are too. Now I want to show you some other things about these two prophets. They have this incredible awesome power fire flows out of their mouth you know that's an incredible thing if you were to see something like that now you know in the kingdom of heaven and the age in which we live god does miracles but he always does them it seems like discreetly doesn't he well in the old testament there were miracles that weren't so discreet remember elijah on the mountain with the fire coming down and consuming the offering and then the killing of all the prophets of baal just over and over, the parting of the Red Sea. Remember, this is going back to be like the Old Testament. And so now, again, in the 70th week, it's like the Old Testament again. It's no longer discreet miracles. It's miracles that you can witness and you can see, just like in the Old Testament. They have this fire that flows out of their mouths and devours their, devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed in this way. Now look at verse 6. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophecy. That's three and a half years. Three and a half years. You know, it seems like it's been raining three and a half years, but I remember back to last August. Okay, right now, all of the fields out there where the cattle are, I mean, they are knee high and some places hip high with grass and, uh, and weeds too. But last August, there was nothing out there. And that was what? We went 30, 45 days, maybe even as much as 60 days without any significant rain. This is three and a half years of no rain. Now, I don't believe they're going to be silent about this. I think they're going to be talking about this, that this is what they're doing. God has given them the authority to do this, and they're not going to allow it to rain. This is something that Elijah also did. So they have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. They have power over the waters to turn them into blood. That's like a plague in Egypt, correct? And to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So now, can you see how a world, a godless world, is going to hate these two prophets? Now, I want to show you something going back to the trumpets. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read them to you. Trumpet number one was hail and fire mixed with blood. Trumpet number two was the sea turning to blood. Now, trumpet number three was sour water, which we said as a result of wormwood. That could be a result of nuclear war. And then darkness was the fourth, which could be nuclear winter. We don't really know. 
But these also could be just plagues, or that could be the way the plague was brought about. Do you see it? See, I don't know about you, but I never really realized that probably the trumpet judgments, which are also in the first three and a half years, are plagues of the two prophets that are bringing about. And what do you think the prophets are going to be talking about? Remember the scriptures and how what a powerful witness tool the book of Revelation is going to be during that time? You could go to an unbeliever if you were living during that time and say, this is what's happened so far, look. This is what's going to happen next. What an incredible witness tool. What do you think the 144,000 are going to be using? Well, they're going to be using the resurrection of Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins by his blood, but also they're going to be using the prophecy that is matching the day in which they're living. The two prophets also are going to be doing the same thing. They're going to be talking about the trumpet judgments and that they're going to cause it not to rain. They're going to, there's going to be hail and fire mixed with blood. There's going to be darkness. The waters are going to be turned to, to, to sour, undrinkable water. The sea is going to be turned to blood. All of these things. What a great and powerful way to witness. And I'm telling you, these two prophets are either going to be loved or they're going to be hated. There's nowhere in between. You know, didn't Jesus say something like that? He said, you were either for me or you're against me. So I think it's very possible that some of these trumpets are a result of the plagues of the two prophets. The time period is the same of their prophesying and their ministry and all during this time. Remember, the hail, fire mixed with blood, also that fire when it hits the ground during a time when it doesn't rain. It's an extreme fire hazard. This is not a good time to live on the earth. Now in verse 7, it says, when they have finished their testimony. You know, the world is going to think there is such a great victory when these two prophets are killed. But look at what the Scripture says, when they have finished. The same thing was with Jesus. After his ministry was finished, Satan had an apparent victory over him by his crucifixion. Do you see the, the parallels and the similarity between the two? Now, also here is a message to us because when they have finished their testimony, you know what? You will not go before your time. I mean, we all have free will, but at the same time, we are the body of Christ and we have a purpose on this earth. And God, when it's time, your time, when your testimony is done, then you'll go home. God is sovereign, and you're his children. And don't fear it. I mean, sure, we fear death to some degree because it's unknown. We don't know exactly know what it's going to be like. We've never experienced that. Has anybody experienced that in here? Check your neighbor's pulse again. They're probably silent on the subject. But we also, like them, have a testimony. What is, what is our testimony and our witness? Our testimony is our lives. It is what God has done in our own lives. Then look, the beast that comes up out of the abyss, remember the beast that comes up out of the abyss, that Satan will make war with them. Well, how does he do that? We know that he does that through the Antichrist. Remember, God allows for, it seems like, equal opposite deception. This Antichrist is going to be the embodiment of Satan. Just like Jesus Christ was the God man, the Antichrist is the Satan man. They're going to have the ability to work miracles also. God is going to allow them to have that ability, and people are going to think that he is the Messiah. People are going to think that he is God. It's going to be a powerful deception. Jesus said that if it's possible, implying that it's not, even the elect could be deceived by this. You know, we're not going to live through that time, but there will be millions and millions of people that do, and they're going to be deceived by this. Now, when he makes war with them and kills them and overcomes them, then he goes into the temple and declares himself to be God in the rebuilt temple. Now look at verse 8. I told you these guys, they were hated. And don't be surprised when people hate you. 
if you are the lampstand now, and people hate the lampstand that much then, then don't be surprised if godless people don't like you. Verse 8, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also the Lord was crucified. So that's in Jerusalem. So their dead bodies will lie in the street. Now look at verse 9. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Now that's hatred, isn't it? They want them to lie in the street and rot. They want to enjoy the victory of their death as long as possible. Now, God allows that to take place because something incredible is going to happen. You know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when he came up out of that tomb, there were many witnesses. The apostles, as many as 500 at one time, saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ. The whole world is going to witness this resurrection. Now look at what it says. I want to show you something, some advanced knowledge that's in the Bible. Those from the peoples and tribes, this is verse 9, and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies three and a half days. Look at verse 10. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. Well, how does the whole world see the two dead prophets? At John's time, How did he think this was going to happen? You can't travel from the other side of the world to Jerusalem to see it in three and a half days while they're laying there. So how does the whole world see it? TV. Well, that wasn't there when John wrote this. In fact, that was an apparent controversy for many, many years in the Scriptures because that's impossible until modern times. And then you look at the Scripture and say, oh, okay, well, that's not impossible. That's obvious. But it wasn't obvious until 70 years ago. When was television invented? I hit that pretty good, didn't I? 70 years ago. That's about right. So, But people will see it. They will see it all over the TV. They will see the two dead bodies. They love the fact that these two people, these two prophets die. So much so that when they die, they celebrate it by giving gifts to each other. Now that's hatred. You know, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ by giving gifts to one another. And then the, the kings or the magi from the east brought presents to the Lord Jesus Christ to celebrate his birth and his coming, right? We celebrate Christmas as to remember Jesus Christ and his birth and his coming as a God-man. They're going to celebrate their own Christmas, celebrating the death of these two people. That's how much. The world hates them has turned. Remember it says over and over, it says in the Bible, and they would not repent of their works. They would not repent. They hate God. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because those two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. You know, I have to think about the two, maybe some people on the earth that do repent and become believers because of their testimony or the 144,000. We know there's going to be a great revival, but think of them during this time as they see on TV the two prophets. They were probably like heroes to them. Of course, they know what's going to happen, but as they lied in the streets, how did they feel when everybody else is celebrating the death of their hero, their heroes? And how do they feel about that? Well, they also have the benefit of the Scripture, and they go, just wait, three and a half days. Just wait. Just wait. Verse 11, but after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. That's awesome right there. I want to turn back to Matthew chapter 24. I stopped there earlier on purpose. I want to show you something. Jesus was very clear on the subject here at this point in time for the abomination of desolation. Remember that verse 15, the abomination of desolation. That's where we are now in chapter 11. And look at Jesus' warning. It says, then those who are in Judea. So remember I told you it switches. If you go back earlier, it's talking about the church in Matthew 24. Now it's not talking about the church anymore. It's talking about Judea. It says, if you are in Judea, flee to the mountains. 
Jesus is telling them, run. When the Antichrist goes into the temple, and you see that, run. He's warning them. Look at this, verse 17. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get his things that are out, that are, I can't read today. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are in his house. He's telling him, if you're on the housetop, don't even go down to the house to get your things. Run. Well, here, have you ever wondered why they're on their housetop? Here's why I think they're on their housetop. In Jerusalem, after three and a half days, when those two prophets stand up, and start rising up to heaven. And you see that happen on TV, but you live in Jerusalem, don't you think you'll want to see it for yourself? I mean, think of that. If you're in Jerusalem, and you have a way to go outside and to look up and to see it with your own eyes, because you can't believe everything you see on TV, right? And then Jesus says, look, if you're on your housetop, don't go down to get things that are in the house. Run. Run. Why? Because the bold judgments are coming and the Antichrist is absolutely turning up the heat on persecution of believers. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. It's Jewish. For then... There will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. This is the last three and a half years. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. That's speaking of the Jews. Now, we can, I'll get into this later at the coming of Jesus Christ, but it looks like they are evacuated, a lot of them, and they've they are evacuated. They go to a place called Petra. But we'll get to that. Now going back to Revelation chapter 11. Were you hoping that this is going to be one of those short ones? <laughs> yeah, I was joking last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago with somebody. I said, I said you know, we do long, I'll do long messages, and one of these days I'm going to do a really short one. I'm just going to get up and say, Obey God, you bunch of sap suckers. Amen. And then we can all just go. You wouldn't know what to do if I did that. What's that? Get a, get a new preacher. Well, yeah, you probably should at that point. Okay, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Again, modern things in an ancient book about things that are going to happen, okay? And so they were raised up from the dead. Now, three things. I'm going to wrap it up here. Amen. Remember the two prophets. The God of the Old Testament is the same God that we serve now, okay? He's the same God, and he, has, he is awesome in power. He is awesome in love. And think of these two prophets as they laid in the street. What a message to the world. See, Satan had the power over death over them, but God had the power to overcome it with life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's also, do you see it all in the book of Revelation? Satan has the power over death. God has the power over life. Which one do we serve? We serve the God of life. Never forget that. Our physical bodies are in decline, and we're all going to experience death unless Jesus comes back for the church first. We're all going to experience that. But it doesn't sound like the two prophets were very worried about it. They just, they just finished up their testimony. They preached the gospel. They had the power over their enemies by the power of God. They lived their life. They died knowing that the God they serve is the God of life. You know, you also are going to be raised from the dead. Just as certainly as these two prophets going back to the empty tomb of Jesus Christ, he was raised from the dead, you're going to be raised from the dead. We serve a God of life. He is the resurrection and the life. Never forget that. God is awesome. The next thing, 
even in our lives, even though we're not going to live through this time period, bad things are going to happen. But remember who your God is. Trust your God. Trust him. He's trustworthy. If he can do these things and bring about these events, trust him. Don't live your life based upon fear of bad things happening. Don't live your life based upon fear of death. Live your life based upon love and truth and Jesus Christ. Now, the last thing I want to leave you with, the two olive trees that are the lampstands during this time period, the first three and a half years, they're not here yet. We are the lampstands. Our church is a lampstand. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have a ministry. That's why we're here today. We're here, yes, to encourage one another. We're here to study the Word of God. We're here to praise the Lord. But at the same time, we are a team. We're a body of Christ. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. We're the lampstands now. It's not time to pass the lampstand off to the two prophets. We have a purpose. We have a function. We have light to shine. Remember, we serve the God of life, not the God of death. We serve the God of life, and while we're here, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the oil, we can shine brightly. We can do that through ministering in our neighborhoods. We can do that through worship here. We can do that by sending out more missionaries. We can do that individually in our own homes, in our own neighborhoods. Never forget, Satan loves the power of deception. We are in physical decline. Bad things happen all the time, but we serve the God of life, the God of the resurrection. And we are the lampstand, and may our light shine bright in a dark world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And God, help us as we go through this life. It's so easy to forget who we are in Christ it's so easy to forget our purpose in this life that we are to carry the lampstand, to carry the light into the dark world. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that that tomb is empty. And God, looking to the future during the first three and a half years as the two prophets lay in the street for three and a half days, God, thank you for raising them from the dead. Thank you for letting the whole world by the power of the television and satellites and all of that stuff Thank you for letting the whole world see it because we've been declaring the resurrection of Jesus Christ for years and many people refuse to believe it. God, thank you so much for Jesus Christ. Thank you that we have the honor of serving him. Thank you that we have forgiveness of sins. And God, thank you that we are the lampstand now. In Jesus' name, amen.